Memoirs of the Reverend George Whitfield, Chapter 9, from his leaving Edinburgh, 1741, to his return to that city in the year 1742. Mr. Whitfield, having left Edinburgh in the latter end of October 1741, set out for Abergavenny, A-V-E-R-G-A-V-E-N-N-Y, in Wales, where having some time ago formed a resolution to enter into a married state, he married one Mrs. James, a widow between 30 and 40 years of age, of whom, he says, she has been a housekeeper many years, once gay, but for three years last passed a despised follower of the Lamb of God. From Abergavenny, he went to Bristol, where he preached twice a day with his usual success. Upon returning to London in the beginning of December, he received letters from Georgia concerning his orphan family, which, with respect to their external circumstances, were a little discouraging. On the other hand, he had most comfortable accounts of the fruits of his ministry in Scotland. This made him think of paying another visit there in the spring. Meantime, he had the pleasure of seeing his labors attended with the divine blessing at London and Bristol. And from Colchester, he writes, December 23rd, 1741. Last Thursday evening, the Lord brought me hither. I preached immediately to our friends in a large barn and had my master's presence. Both the power and the congregation increased. On Sunday, Providence opened a door for my preaching in St. John's, one of the parish churches. Great numbers came. On Sunday afternoon, after I preached twice at Colchester, I preached at Mr. S. at the hill, six miles off, and again at night at S-T-R-O-U-D. The people seemed to be more hungry than ever, and the Lord to be more among them. Yesterday morning I preached at Painswick in the parish church, here in the afternoon and again at night in the barn. God gives me unspeakable comfort and uninterrupted joy. Here seems to be a new awakening and a revival of the work of God. I find several country people were awakened when I preached at Twixburg and have heard of three or four that have died in the Lord. We shall never know what good field preaching has done till we come to judgment. Many who were prejudiced against me begin to be of another mind, and God shows me more and more that when a man's ways please the Lord, he will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Tomorrow morning I purpose to set out for Abergavenny and to preach at Bristol in Wilts, Colchester, and Gloucestershire before I see London. In the latter end of December, he came to Bristol, where he continued nearly a month, preaching twice every day and writing to his friends in London and Scotland. He also set up a general monthly meeting to read correspondent letters. From Bristol, he returned to Colchester and January 28, 1743, writes, On Friday last I left Bristol, having first settled affairs almost as I could wish. At Kingston I administered the sacraments on Wednesday night. It was the Lord's Passover. On Thursday we had a sweet love feast. On Friday the Lord was with me twice at Talkington on Saturday morning. I broke up some fallow ground at Newport and in the evening preached to many thousands at Stroud, on Monday morning at Painsworth, and ever since twice a day here. Our congregations, I think, are larger than at Bristol. Every sermon is blessed. On his way to London, February 23rd, he was still further encouraged by receiving letters from America, informing him of the remarkable success of the gospel there, and that God had stirred up some wealthy friends to assist his orphans in their last late extremities. Footnote. The everlasting God reward all their benefactors. I find there has been a fresh awakening among them. I am informed that 12 Negroes belonging to a planter lately converted at the orphan house are savingly brought home to Jesus Christ. End of the footnote. Upon his return to London, he went on with greater zeal and success, if possible, than ever. Our Savior, he says, writing to a brother, April 6, 1742, is doing great things in London daily. 
I rejoice to hear that you are helped in your work. So let this encourage you. Go on, go on. The more we do, the more we may do for Jesus. I sleep and eat but little, and am constantly employed from morning till midnight, and yet my strength is daily renewed. O oh, free grace, it fires my soul and makes me long to do something for Jesus. It is true, indeed, I want to go home, but here are so many souls ready to perish for lack of knowledge, that I am willing to tarry below as long as my Master has worked for me. From this principle of compassion to perishing souls, he now ventured to take a very extraordinary step. It had been the custom for many years past in the holiday seasons to erect booths in more fields for mountain backs, banks, players, puppet shows, which were attended from morning to night by innumerable multitudes of the lower sort of people. He formed a resolution to preach the gospel among them and execute it on Whit Monday at 6 o'clock in the morning. Attended by a large congregation of praying people, he began. Thousands who were waiting there, gaping for the usual diversions, all flocked around him. His text was John 3.14. They glazed, they listened, they wept, and many seemed to be stung with deep conviction for their past sins. All was hushed and solemn. Being thus engaged, says he, I venture out again at noon, when the fields were quite full, and could scarce help smiling to see thousands, when a merry Andrew was tramping to them, upon observing me mount a stand upon the other side of the field, deserting him, till not so much as one was left behind, but all flocked to hear the gospel. But this, together with a complaint that had been taken near twenty or thirty pounds less that day than usual, so enraged the owners of the booths, that when I came to preach a third time in the evening, in the midst of the sermon of Mary Andrew, got up upon a man's shoulder, and advancing near the, pul the pulpit, attempted to slash me with a long, heavy whip several times. Soon after they got a recruiting sergeant with his drum to pass through the congregation, but I desired the people to make way for the king's officer, which was quietly done. Finding these efforts to fail, a large body, quite on the opposite side, assembled together, and having got a great pole for their standard, advance with sound of drum in a very threatening manner till they came near the skirts of the congregation. Uncommon courage was given to both preacher and hearers, for just as they approached us with looks full of resentment, I know not but what accident they quarreled among themselves, threw down their staff, went their way, leaving, however, many of their company behind, who before we had done, I trust were brought over to join the besieged party. I think I continued in praying, preaching, and singing, for the noise was too great at times to preach about three hours. We then retired to the tabernacle, where thousands flocked. We were determined to pray down the booth, but blessed be God, more substantial work was done. At a moderate computation, I received, I believe, a thousand notes from persons under conviction, and soon after, upwards of 300 were received into the society in one day. Some are married that have lived together without marriage. One man had exchanged his wife for another and given 14 shillings in exchange. Numbers that seemed as if it were to have been bred up for Tyborn were at that time plucked as firebrands out of the burning. I cannot help adding that several little boys and girls who were fond of sitting round me on the pulpit while I preached and hanging and handing to me people's notes, though they were often pelted with eggs and dirt, thrown at me, never once gave way. But on the contrary, every time I was struck, turned up their little weeping eyes and seemed to wish they could receive the blows for me. God made them, in their growing years, great and living martyrs for him, who out of the mouth of babes and sucklings perfected praise. End of chapter 9, having been read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire to the glory of God.